Now, I'd like to say uh, a bit about what it means as one progresses in the process of self-knowledge, uh, what it means to learn about each of those items of the uh, that go to make up the structure of the psyche that I spoke of uh, earlier. Uh, let's start with the ego. That's the starting point for everything. Uh, one of the uh, one of the, the goals of of the life process, just the natural life process, as as well as the analytic process, is maximum ego development. Uh, one can have no, no real analysis, one can have no real uh, confrontation with the unconscious until one has a sturdy, responsible, and uh, ethical ego prepared to, uh, to have that encounter. Before that, there's no question of depth analysis. Uh, all, all that uh, is available is a supportive psychotherapy that promotes ego development. You see, it's vitally important, just considering the, uh, the social aspect of the, of the matter, that uh, the members of society have good, strong, reliable egos. That means they have to have a, an authentic sense of, of their own identity. Uh, they have to have acquired a the uh, responsible character structure that enables them to uh, function responsibly uh, in relation to other people. That's, that's all a product of ego development. So uh, just to start with, uh, good, uh, good ego development is good not only for the individual, it's good uh, for the society that the individual is a part of. Then the question of, of the persona. Uh, what value is awareness of, of the persona to the individual and society? Here, here again, uh, as with all self-knowledge, uh, both the individual and society benefit. You see, it, it commonly happens that to a greater or lesser extent, an individual is uh, identified with this persona. It's so convenient. It's hard enough to, uh, to acquire uh, competence in a professional career. Uh, and once that has been achieved, the satisfactions of that achievement uh, uh, are uh, often so significant that there's a strong tendency for the uh, individual then to identify with the professional persona that one learns in the, in the course of his professional training. So the minister learns his persona as he, as he uh, goes through theological seminary and, and then starts, uh, starts his first uh, uh, job as a assistant pastor. The, uh, the medical student learns the medical persona, the, the lawyer learns, uh, learns his, and, and so on. And once that's learned, uh, it, it makes things work so smoothly to operate out of it that there's a strong tendency to identify with it. But the trouble is, uh, for society as a whole, that when, that when one uh, meets one's doctor or one's pastor or one's lawyer or, or whatever, one isn't meeting a full human being. You meet the mask. And I'll speak for my own, my own profession. I won't belittle any other profession that I don't know, but I can tell you that uh, it's a real problem in the medical profession. Uh, doctors are very busy, and it takes too much time to be real. 
it's much easier to function out of your medical persona. And uh, the great advantage of it, the temporary advantage is, uh, it's, it's like skating on a pond of uh, frozen ice. Uh, it doesn't take any effort. You, you don't have to respond out of, out of deeper human realities. And you can get a lot more work done in the day, you, you see. You can see more patients. Uh, if you take time to listen to them and, and respond to them humanly, uh, you get caught up and uh, you uh, get way behind in your schedule. That's all understandable, but uh, if, if self-knowledge is to proceed and if, uh, if uh, individuals are, are going to achieve full, well-rounded uh, human potentiality, uh, it's important for them to discover the reality of the persona and the uh, fact that it's not identical with the ego and that uh, if they choose to identify with it uh, now, and, now and then, uh, they are uh, diminishing them, uh, themselves both psychologically and humanly. And once those things become known, then the, uh, the initial identification is broken. And even though one may have to op operate out of that persona at times, then you know what you're doing. And it makes a world of difference whether you're doing it consciously or unconsciously, because choice is involved. Then turning to the next item, the, uh, the shadow. What's the social advantage of uh, being aware of the shadow? I can tell you it's immense. Because as long as one is unconscious of, of the shadow, uh, there's almost infallibly, it gets projected. It gets projected onto somebody that provides some, some hook uh, some quality that uh, maybe only in small degree that corresponds to the nature of one's own shadow. Uh, and then when that happens, uh, the, uh, the, the projector uh, has the uh, delightful experience of locating evil. It's out there in you. And uh, now, I, now I know uh, uh, what, to, what to attack in order to make the world a better place. And so uh, in, in, uh, in lesser shadow projections, uh, I guess no great harm uh, is, is done. It, uh, it, uh, it's an abrasion in, in the general general mechanics of, of ordinary human relationships. But once it starts operating on a large collective scale, shadow projection can be disastrous. And I hardly need, need to spell out the, the examples of it because they're everywhere to be seen uh, where you've got uh, one faction opposing another faction and uh, attributing dark, evil, if not diabolical, uh, implications uh, uh, on, the, on the enemy fa faction. We see this everywhere in the world, and I, I'm not going to go into the details. But uh, this is all, all a consequence of shadow projection. And uh, it's really a, a disgrace for uh, an educated and uh, supposedly relatively mature uh, human being to, uh, to be caught engaging in a uh, crude shadow projection in this day and age. But disgrace or not, it happens all the time. Uh, and 
it's a grave damage to, um, to our social fabric. So to the extent that an in individual, through the analytic process, becomes aware uh, of his shadow, uh, he is then inoculated from shadow projection because he recognizes that the, the particular quality or idea or mode of living that is so annoying to him in the other person is an expression of his own shadow, uh, which accounts for the annoyance. We can have likes or dislikes, but when a certain level of affect uh, enters the picture, that's an infallible indication of a shadow projection. And uh, people unconscious of their shadow are a, a, a grave danger uh, to, uh, to the welfare of society as a whole. Now, turning to the animus and, and the anima, we're, we're reaching a deeper layer now. Uh, and here, the uh, social aspects uh, can, cannot be spelled out in such simple terms. They're, they're present but they're more complex and, and occult and a little harder to express. But certainly we can say that an individual who has even a rudimentary awareness of the reality of, of the anima or the animus uh, is going to have a more authentic, a, a more conscious, a more fruitful and realistic relation to the to the opposite sex. And after all, that relationship between the sexes is quite fundamental to this whole social process. The, the family is based on it and uh, the raising of children and uh, the, the welfare of uh, the uh, and psychological uh, early development of children that is very dependent on the level of conscious relationship that exists between, between the parents. And uh, that, uh, uh, that type of understanding relationship that uh, can endure the inevitable conflict between the opposites of the sexes is, uh, is very much promoted uh, and, and helped by uh, an awareness of uh, the uh, animus and anima, because with that awareness, then one one avoids the crudest of uh, of projections, and can relate to the uh, to the partner in terms of their reality, rather than in terms of the illusory expectations one has when one has projected the anima or animus uh, onto the partner. Now, coming finally to the uh, question of the self, the awareness of, of the self. The self is the center and totality of the psyche. One of its synonyms is the, is the inner God image. It's the transpersonal authority of the psyche. Uh, the ego is the smaller authority, and the, and the self is the larger authority. Uh, when one has made a contact with the self, uh, the ego then becomes relativized and recognizes that its life must be uh, uh, governed by an authority uh, higher than itself. Now, 
Now, what, what does such a recognition have to do with society? A great deal indeed. In a certain sense, we can say that society is the exteriorized mirror of the psyche. Uh, every society has uh, a, a leader of, of some sort. Uh, at one stage, it was the, it was the king or the, or the, or the president. Uh, occasionally, it's, uh, it's an oligarchy of, uh, of aristocrats, but uh, always, in order for a, a society to, to be cohesive and, and exist organically, it has to have a central authority. And that central external social authority is a mirror of the inner authority of the self. That's why when one has dreams of a, of a king or of a president or of Washington, D.C., uh, in most cases, those dreams refer to the self. So what's at issue here is the individual's uh, relation to authority. Uh, if one has no uh, connection to the, uh, to the self, and particularly when the, when the ego is weak, when there's low, low level of uh, psychological differentiation, uh, especially in times of uh, turmoil, social turmoil and, uh, and distress, there is a strong tendency for the self, the center, central organizing authority, principle of the psyche, to be projected. Uh, because in times of turmoil, the, uh, the compensatory sec uh, aspect of the psyche activates and turmoil uh, uh, then tends to constellate uh, order. Disorder constellates order, and uh, uh, order in such circumstances often has to be imposed uh, with some level of uh, discipline and authoritarianism. Uh, and so what can happen in such cases then is that one gets uh, massive collective projections of the self uh, in, onto the, uh, the, uh, the leader, the Fuhrer, for instance. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, I'm looking for an adequate word to, to describe uh, it, it. It's an, it's an, a lesson of instruction of a magnitude that could hardly be uh, exaggerated as to the danger of the projection, the collective projection of the self. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. Uh, we see it happening in all sorts of uh, uh, charismatic uh, religious cults. Uh, it, it's happening in small scale all over, scattered uh, all around. And as we lose our containment in, in, our, uh, uh, in our conventional religious myth, this danger is going to become more and more uh, operative. Uh, and it's probably the, uh, the greatest threat to humanity, uh, much greater than the uh, uh, nuclear bomb. Jung puts it all very succinctly in answer to Job when, he's, when he says, 
God needs man, and uh, encounter with man has an effect on him. Uh, now that's that's a symbolic statement in psychological terms. The self needs the ego and the ego's awareness and relation to it in order to be transformed. That, that puts it in, in our neutral psychological uh, language. Uh, the, the self or the, or the God image in its unconscious form, as I've, as I've said before, uh, is a paradoxical union of opposites. This is the ground of our psychological being. And uh, the Christian God of love is only one half of it. Uh, that's why Satan has never disappeared. Uh, he's, he leads his separate existence, but he's still around. And Jung has, has demonstrated that uh, the Christ and Satan are the two sons of, the two opposite sons of the same paradoxical deity. And when these images uh, come into the range of empirical experience, uh, they, uh, they require some reconciliation. You see, they, they, they generate an inner conflict that, that's intolerable un, until it achieves uh, a reconciliation. And this is what happens when the, when the individual uh, encounters the, the primordial God image in its paradoxical oppositeness. Uh, it, it experiences the activation of the conflict within the nature of the Godhead. And since also contained within the whole dynamic is the potential for a, a, a union and a reconciliation of those opposites, uh, that can often be achieved in the individuation process uh, by the process of active imagination. And the, the net result then is uh, that um, the psyche is no longer split. The Christian psyche is split. And that means everybody, uh, whether you're a professing Christian or not, it's irrelevant. It's part of the, the psychology, the collective psychology we all share. We're all split. Because uh, the, uh, the God image is split. And the split occurred uh, even before Christianity. Uh, 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 it was split by, by Plato and the Stoics. So that the, it's got a philosophical source too. That, that split, uh, that paradoxical doubleness of deity is, is what undergoes reconciliation and transformation when an individual human consciousness engages this depth issue in its own individual life, then that, that little piece of the collective psyche that is carried by the individual has been transformed. And if there are enough individuals who have had this experience and who have participated in this transformation of the God image, then they act as a kind of leaven to society as a whole, and very gradually uh, a new collective God image is born out of that society as a whole. You know, the question often comes up uh, in, in modern thinking, is Christianity doomed? Uh, 
has it has it run out. Um, Jung makes a very interesting point uh, in that regard. He points out that the Christian myth itself contains uh, as part of its uh, thematic structure the death of God. Uh, I want to see if I can spell this out because I think it's of some importance. According to the Christian myth, and I, and I, I elaborate all this in my book, The Christian Archetype. According to the Christian myth, God, the God, remember that in psychological terms, whenever I use the phrase God, I'm referring to the psychological God image. Psychology does not presume to know anything about the metaphysical deity. We're talking about the psychological God image, which is in, within the range of, of empirical uh, experience. But according to the, to the Christian myth, God descends to earth by incarnating himself as a man through the agency of the Holy Spirit who impregnates the Virgin Mary and God as, as man then lives a human life on the, on the earth, uh, incarnated. He goes through the passion, he dies, and he's resurrected and then ascends to heaven. So that in his incarnated form, uh, the myth describes uh, the deity as passing through a death. What then happens after his death, according to the Christian myth, is that the Holy Spirit descends again on Pentecost. And this time, uh, according to the, uh, to the church dogma, the church is born. Pentecost is considered to be the birthday of the church. So that uh, the incarnation cycle repeats itself. The Holy Ghost, the, uh, the, the deity, descends and is incarnated a second time in the church, which describes itself as the body of Christ. Then, according to uh, certain theologians, this is stated explicitly. The church, as the body of Christ, is obliged to live out the same fateful sequence as did Christ. That means the church must also go through a passion and a death. Now the church projects that anticipation onto the last days as far off as possible. But considering this psychologically, uh, we might consider that that's happening right now. That the church as the body of, of Christ, the, the collective incarnation of Christ, so to speak. Christ was the first individual incarnation. The church was the second collective incarnation who must also go through the, the passion and death and resurrection. And now, according to my understanding, uh, the resurrection will then initiate a third cycle in which the Holy Spirit will be now incarnating itself in empirical individual human beings. That's Jung's point. And
And as you can see, as I spell it out that way, uh, that's, uh, that's a, a consistent and uh, a quite appropriate uh, continuation and reinterpretation of the Christian myth. Jung was very concerned that the that the treasuries of the, the treasure of the, uh, the the Christian myth not be lost to uh, uh, to modern man, and uh, what he's done is he's, he's provided a a transformative and reinterpretive understanding of it in in his uh, notion of continuing incarnation, which uh, uh, preserves all of the rich Christian symbolism, you see, but uh, now understood on a psychological individual level. Uh, and this is my understanding of what the new epoch means and why Jung is an epochal man. We are in for some uh, very grave uh, disturbances in in the collective uh, social fabric of Western society, uh, and Jung was keenly aware of that. And uh, he even made the uh, remarkable statement in in a letter that uh, he wrote answer to Job. Uh, because uh, he did did not want his moral laxity uh, to uh, uh, allow things to drift to towards the impending catastrophe. Uh, what he what he revealed there. And, and is expressed very clearly, is that um, his book, Answer to Job, is the antidote to the apocalypse. If one can understand Answer to Job, uh, one will be in a position to survive psychologically the, the onslaught of, of the apocalypse, of the of the transition from, from one epoch uh, to another, uh, because he, he describes uh, the psychological meaning of this collective event and what it means without summarizing the book, which is impossible in this setting. What it means is that a process is going on in which the God image is undergoing transformation. And the process of that transformation requires human awareness of the divine nature in order for that nature to change. That puts it in a nutshell. Uh, in fact, I'll repeat it. The essence of answer to Job, which is the antidote allowing one to survive psychologically the apocalypse, is the realization that the apocalypse is a process in the transformation of God in which by means of entering human consciousness, the divine nature can undergo a transformation and change its nature. 
It's all spelled out in the book of Job. Uh, I also uh, discuss this matter in my little book on Blake's engravings for the, for the book of Job called The Encounter with, with the Self. Uh, you see, part of the uh, part of the divine nature. Remember, I'm speaking psychologically, not not metaphysically. Psychologists know nothing about metaphysics. Uh, depth psychologists are good Kantians who uh, who recognize that uh, uh, metaphysical statements are beyond human uh, possibility, and so that. They, they make no, no metaphysical assumptions at all. We're talking about the psychological God image, that that God image is a union of opposites. It's not only Christ, it's also Satan. It's not only Yahweh of the book of Job, it's, it's also Behemoth and Leviathan. And that paradoxical God image with that dual nature uh, is in the process of being transformed through being experienced by human consciousness. Being seen by human consciousness is the agent of its transformation. One individual at a time. It's not done collectively, not done in committee. It's done one lonely individual at a time who has the experience of the divine ambiguity and in the process of that experience penetrates that uh, paradoxical self with human consciousness which transforms it. This is uh, the process I see uh, now in its initial phases and which uh, will continue with uh, with more and more intensity uh, in the collective. Uh, you, you see, uh, if we have more experiences uh, of the same nature as the not Nazi Holocaust, uh, those are psychological events. Those are expressions of the collective human psyche. They weren't natural disasters. They didn't fall out of heaven. They were psychological events. So they, they are phenomena describing the nature of the collective psyche. And that's the kind of stuff that we're in store for as we go through this, uh, this catastrophic transformation from one age to the next in which the divine image is undergoing transformation. The world hangs on a thin thread. Yeah. And that is the psyche of man. Yeah. Nowadays, we are not threatened by elementary catastrophes. There is no such thing as an age bomb. That is all man's doing. Yeah. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche?